have everybody here this morning as we gather in his presence. You know. The greatest place to be is to be together with brothers and sisters in the Lord. In the Lord. That's the greatest place to be. And that is where we are this morning. Praise the name of Jesus. Okay, we want to um, continue with our series on living the spiritual life. We've been looking at Romans 18. If you can get your Bible or your phones, we'll read Romans, Romans 8, not Romans 18. I beg your pardon. Uh, Romans 8, we've been talking about living the spiritual life. And um, last week we saw that there was, there's two aspects of us. There's the spiritual and there's the natural part of us. And when we talk about living by the spirit, we're actually saying that, you know, where your thoughts, your words, your actions come from must be coming from the spirit within. Um, and of course, our spirit is filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what makes us children of God. And um, this is so critical. Uh, just last week from Tuesday through to Thursday, Berlin was taking us through uh, scripture in relation to what is happening now and um, what is yet to happen. And this morning we were talking about this and um, I said to him that as believers, we can't listen to the news or look at what is happening in the world to, to shape how we think. Because if you do that, you will miss God because God doesn't work based on what is happening in this world. He's working from a higher plane, from his purposes and his plans. And so... Living by the Spirit enables us to see through the lens of God. And um, in, in the book of Chronicles, there was a little story there about uh, King Ahab who decided to go to war. He invited Jehoshaphat to be part of the conquest he was going on. And in the natural, it just seemed like he wanted to go to war until the prophet Micaiah came on the scene. And he brought the spiritual perspective of that situation. And the spiritual perspective was such that it wasn't that Ahab just wanted to go to war. No. There was a plot from heaven to assassinate him. Now think about it for a moment. In the natural, it just seemed like he decided to go to war. But in the spirit... In the spiritual realm, there was a decision to take him out. <laughs> so it is important for us to have a spiritual perspective, to be able to live and see and move and think by the Spirit. And so we're looking at that. So let's look at Romans uh, 8. And today we'll be focusing, last week we saw that, you know, we as children of God, we're spirit. What makes us children of God is our spirit. It's not our soul. It's not our body. It's not what comprises of our natural identity. So every one of us have a natural identity. But that isn't what makes us children of God, right? What makes us children of God is our spirit. And we, we read in uh, Romans 8 that he who doesn't have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So right now in your spirit... You have the Holy Spirit in your spirit. You're, you're full of the Spirit of God. And that is what makes us children of God. So last week we saw that, you know, to uh, begin this journey of walking by the Spirit, you need to recognize you have a spirit and you are a spirit. And the Christian life is lived from the place of your spirit, not your natural identity, not just your soul and your body. Your soul and your body has a function. They're, they're, they're there to obey the dictates of the Spirit, right? 
This is why the Bible says, walk by the Spirit. Our soul and our body, our emotions. So for example, as a believer, you have to learn not to just move by emotions. Because the Spirit doesn't lead you by your emotions. He leads you by your spirit. He leads you by your spirit. So we saw that we have a spirit. We are spirit. You know, God sees us from the place of the spirit. To be alive or to be dead has to do with the state in which your spirit is in. So when you say, I'm a Christian, you're describing who you are or how you look in the spirit. So today we want to look at the statement, not of the flesh, and denying our flesh, right? So let's look at Romans 8. Um, let's start from verse 5. Let's look at Romans 8. We'll start from verse 5. Okay, for those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Meaning that if you are living by the Spirit, your mind, you will be engaging the mind of the Spirit. Right? So remember, there is a natural part of you, there's a spiritual part of you. All those aspects has a mind. There's a mind of the spirit and there's the mind of the flesh. Verse six, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Anytime you feel restless, you, it seems like you can't, you're not having peace, you're feeling disturbed. You need to check where your mind is. You need to check what your mind is thinking and where your mind is thinking from. Right? So the content and the position of your mind is what will determine whether or not you will walk in the peace and the life of the spirit. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Wow, this is, this is an incredible statement. Now think about that for a moment. That means as a believer, if you think by the flesh, you put yourself in an opposite position of God. He's using the word hostile. And that's a militant word. That's a, a word that you use for describing a person and their enemy. And so it shows you how important It is for us to think by the spirit and not by the flesh. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9. However, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. What a statement. (laughs) Do you know, when you become born again, you don't determine who you are. No. It is the spirit of Christ and his inspired word that tells you who you are. That means that it doesn't matter what you've gone through in the past. You cannot let your past define who you are. No, because here is telling you who you are now as a child of God. He says, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of Christ dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, and what does it mean for the body to be dead? It means that it's separate. From God. This isn't the body that God intended us to have. So if you leave your body to function on its own, it will always lead you to sin. Always. 
That is why it's calling this body as dead. Because the body on its own will always lead us to sin. If you don't allow your spirit to lead your body, your body will lead you to sin. The body is dead because of sin. The spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. Verse 12. So then. Now, again, that statement, so then, is, say, is actually saying everything I've said is critical. Because of all that I've said from verse 1 to verse 11, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. That is incredible. Now, I want to draw your attention to um, the fact that we're not of the flesh. Romans 8 9 says, you and I were not in the flesh. And because we're not in the flesh, we're not of the flesh. And so we don't have an obligation to live according to the flesh. That means that when we have stimuli that comes from the natural uh, aspect of us, we don't have to follow it. Now we are empowered by the Spirit to move in the direction of the Holy Spirit. So we've come to realize that we're children of God by the Spirit indwelling us. We've become new creation. The Bible says old things have passed away, all have become new. Again, where is he talking about? Your spirit. Everything is new in your spirit now, right? So if you live by your spirit, life is really good. You can enjoy the Lord. You can walk in peace. You can walk in joy, consistent joy, because the joy of the Lord is in your spirit. Now, because we have come to realize this, that we are children of God, we're now spirit, we need to learn how to appropriate our spirit man. The Bible said 1 John 4, 17, that we are just like Jesus Christ. We are just like Jesus Christ. It says, as he is, so are we in this world. And we must take that. You must take that text and meditate upon it and begin to see yourself in light of who you've become as a child of God. And as he's saying, as he is, so are we in this world. Again, it's not talking about the soul or the body because we don't have the soul and the body of Christ as in physical body. We're not Jewish people, right? We're not from the same family. Our mom is not uh, Mary, neither is our father Joseph, right? We know that it is his spirit that makes us children of God. It is the spirit that enables Jesus to call us brothers and sisters. In Hebrews um, 1, the Bible says this is why he's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. Do, do you know Jesus calls you a brother or a sister? Do you know as believers, we don't even think about this. When you begin to get entrenched in God's perspective about who you've become to him, you will see life in a different way. You see things so much differently. 
Jesus Christ is your brother and mine by his spirit inside of us. The Bible says he who uh, uh, sanctified and those who are being sanctified are of one. The original language is are of one or they are of the same source. That is why he's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. And, and this is not just a joke. It's not like maybe meeting a friend in school and you become close to them and you begin to call them brothers. You know, you can have that kind of relationship. No, th this is not a casual one, brothers and sisters. This is an eternal reality. Jesus cannot just wake up today and deny you. No, he can't. Because of his spirit inside of you and me, he calls us his brother and his sister. Now, because of this, we, we must learn how to deny our flesh, to put it to death. Now, we'll look at what that word means. We'll go to Romans 6 in a minute. But look at um, Romans 8 again. Verse 13, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you do what? You put to death the deeds of the body. You deny the flesh. Now, we read in Romans 8 from verse 5, we see the word flesh used there. Okay? The word flesh, and in, in, in this case, is synonymous to the word pneumaticus, natural. Remember last week we looked at 1 Corinthians 2, 14 and 15. Now you have to remember these scriptures. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 says, the natural person cannot receive the things of the spirit for they are foolishness to him. The natural person. And then 1 Corinthians 2.15 says, the spiritual person judges all things. Right? The natural person cannot receive the things of the spirit. That, that's a very radical statement. That means if you just remain in your natural identity, you cannot engage or receive anything from God. If you let the mind of your uh, natural person dictate to you, you cannot access the peace of Christ. So remember, I think three weeks ago, I said that I gave the illustration. Maybe someone has done or said something that has offended you or hurt you in any way. If you relate to that person by your natural mind, you cannot express the love of God towards them. You can't. Because your natural mind will not let you. And, and also, if God was to look at you and I through the lens of the natural, he can't have a relationship with us. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, God through Christ was reconciling uh, the world to himself, not counting their sin against them. And what is, what is God doing? God is looking at what Jesus has done. And through that, he's relating to us. So, so if, you rem if you remain in your natural identity, you cannot contact the resources and the blessings that is in Christ. Uh, Ephesians 1 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. You cannot contact that when you are in your flesh. You can't. And, and the reason why the Spirit is calling our attention to this, remember, it's not automatic to walk by the Spirit. No. You have to be intentional. You have to choose by the empowerment of the Spirit of Christ. So the word flesh um, is the word socks, right? And again, we want to understand what that means. It's, it's synonymous to 
our soul. It has to do with our soulish and our bodily identity. It signifies the entire human nature, sense and reason without the Holy Spirit. Flesh, which is carnal, you see it um, in some of the translation that use the word carnal, has to do with uh, uh, mere human origin or empowerment. The entire world is operating in the flesh. If you remember the story of Babel, that's human um, effort. Let's build a tower to God. We can do this on our own. You know, that's human effort. That's the flesh. And the Bible said that leads to death. Now, the, the word flesh is generally negative referring to making decisions or actions according to the self. Remember, the soul gives us self-consciousness. The body gives us world consciousness. So if you just remain in the soulish and the bodily space on its own and you're moving or making decisions from that place on its own, it will not lead to the same destination as the spirit leads. This is why as believers, we pray about things, right? You know, there are times maybe you, you might not feel comfortable about something. You, you can't just assume that it's not right. You know, if God, if, if suddenly, um, well, let me say suddenly. Um, I, was, I was thinking about maybe some kind of crazy persecution. But let, let me give you an example. God calls you to go to your neighbor. And tell him that, look, if you don't repent, you'll die and go to hell. (laughs) Now, you think about that message and think, oh, man, that's quite sharp. (laughs) You know, and you yourself, you're feeling uncomfortable thinking about that message anyway. Now, if that is what God has sent you to do, it doesn't matter how you feel. It is your place to ascertain that, Lord, is this you? And if you get the confirmation, you go and do it regardless of how you feel. I remember when I worked in Beacott, one day the Lord said to me, go and speak to the principal and told me some things to tell her. And she wasn't a friend of mine. So I was just going to go in there and say, hey, God said to me to tell you this. (laughs) Right? It would be a lot easier if, if she was in the church. And so I remember one night, um, you know, she was in... Um, the office and uh, the spirit said go and you know I just felt my soul like whoa man what's she gonna think you have all these kind of thoughts so what did I do I went into one of the classroom and I prayed in tongues for about five minutes and I just built myself spiritually and I went in there and delivered that message and guess what it was God that sent me in there so if you just remain in your flesh in your natural identity if you just feel uncomfortable about things and you think that, is, that means that this isn't right, right? I mean, there are things that is very obvious, but there are things that are not. You need to pray and ascertain what the Spirit is leading you to. So this word is generally negative. It has to do with actions according to the self, done apart from faith, that is independent from God's inworking. What is flesh? is by definition displeasing to God. And we see it. For those who live according to the flesh will never please God. You you cannot please God in that way. Mere human nature, it has to do with the earthly nature of man apart from divine influence. And therefore prone to sin and opposed to God. It includes whatever in the soul is weak, low, debased tending to ungodliness and vice. So now Romans 8.13 says, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of your body, you will live. So to be able to move by the spirit, you engage your spirit to separate yourself from the flesh. Remember, when the word death is used in Scripture, it doesn't mean ceasing to exist. Because in our heads, what we learn from when we're growing up culture, 
you know, we, we, you know, people are afraid of death because it's almost like when someone died, they're no longer here. One of the uh, powerful illustrations Roland was given from scripture is that the spiritual realm, the dimension of God, is not in a distant place. It's here. It's right here. Because in the spirit, there's no distance. So when angels are sent, they don't have to travel from like Scotland to uh, Basingstoke. They just appear, right? And so when we think about death, it's not about, look, okay, yeah, I can't see my grandmother anymore. Yeah, you can't see her with your naked eye, right? But she's still alive in a different dimension. So the word death in scripture has to do with being separate. We're separated. So when someone dies, they're separated. The spirit is separate from their body. So it says that we have to learn to separate ourselves from the deeds of our body. Now Luke 9.23 says, If anyone will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. If anyone wants to become my disciple, to become a disciple of Christ simply means you're learning to live like Jesus by his spirit inside of you. You're learning Christ. Ephesians 4 says, this is not how you have learned Christ. So in order to learn how to live like Christ, which is the spirit in you, you have to first deny yourself, separate yourself from your flesh and take up your cross daily and follow him. And you know, um, you, you look at this scripture and you know, m- most of the time we apply the cross to us as suffering, okay? But the major aspect of the cross, Christ did not die because of him. He died because of us. He didn't die his death because he did not sin. The Bible said the wages of sin is death. He didn't sin. That's the reason why he's a spotless lamb. He died by taking on our sin. So he died our death. So one of the crucial revelation of the cross you need to get is that the cross should remind you the truth that you have died with him. (laughs) I remember when God showed me this, I just, I was so excited. Because it was our death. It wasn't his death. I mean, did he die his death? No. It was our death. His suffering, everything. He he was breaking the power of sin. He was disengaging death that functioned in us. He nailed it to the cross. And as we go to Romans, we see something there in a minute. But we have to deny ourselves. The word deny... One of the meaning of the word is reject. You have to learn how to reject the impulses of your soul. That person does something, you feel angry. You want to punch them out. Right? You know, even though we're talking about living by the spirit, remember you still have your soul in your body. Right? And the reason why we have to learn to deny ourselves is because you will have stimuli from your flesh. You will. But you, through the Spirit, you have been brought to a place where you can see that, wait, okay. I know this, how I'm feeling now, it's not coming from the Spirit of Christ. Because I'm meant to have forgiveness for that person, right? And the fact that you can think that way, it's an evidence of the Spirit of Christ inside of you, right? Okay. Okay. So we have to deny ourselves. Luke 9, 23. Ephesians 4, 24 says, 22. He says, to put off your former way of life, your old self. The old self, you have to put it off. Which is being corrupted by its deceitful desire. So sin is incubated in your natural identity. Sin always starts in your soul and your body as a believer. So here he says we have to put off the, the, the former way of life, your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desire. When Satan comes into your life, he's coming to appeal to your flesh. 
When the world is speaking to you, when you're listening to the news, they are speaking to your flesh because they can't speak to your spirit. No. The only way anyone can speak to your spirit is through the spirit of Christ. Twenty-three. He says, to be renewed in the spirit of your mind and to put on the new self, created to be like God in righteousness and holiness. So again, we are supposed to put off, put off our former way of life by putting off the old self, by rejecting, by denying the flesh. Colossians 3 verse 5. It says, put to death Therefore, what is earthly in you? Wow. And, and you read Colossians 3. Um, let, let's look at Colossians 3 for a moment. Colossians 3 from verse 1. He says, if you have been raised with Christ Jesus, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated, at the right hand of God, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. You know, these scriptures, they're going to be so critical for us, brothers and sisters, in these last days. I mean, if you study scripture, you study um, the book of Revelation, the things that are going to happen in the end times, there'll be massive destruction here on earth. You know, there'll be so much chaos. A lot of people, a lot of human beings will die. There'll be all kinds of problems. Now, if you don't learn how to utilize the mind of the spirit, because you, you know, you, you, there's no middle ground, right? Here we see that the mind of the flesh leads to death. The mind of the spirit leads to life and peace. And do you know, we are supposed to be walking in peace in the midst of chaos. And there will be chaos. That, that's why the Spirit has given us this. The revelation, the book of Revelation is there to show us, together with other uh, apocalyptic li literature and all the um, eschatological things that the Bible has given us, things relating to the end, it is to prepare us. When Jesus in Matthew 24 was teaching his disciples, he was preparing them for the chaos. He actually said, look, some of you will be killed. But then he says, let not your heart be troubled. And the only way for you and I to walk in the peace of Christ, it is to allow our minds to be set on the things that are above. The word above has to do with the life that comes from heaven. It has to do with the life of God. And so we're supposed to learn how to move and think by our spirit mind. And then he says, for you have died. <laughs> wow. For you have died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life? Man, you need to know this few words. You need to know this. This is so important. You need to know it and meditate it for like 10 years. The reason why I say that is because we all see our life. If I ask you, how is life? Whatever you think your life is, is how you will respond to that question. Now look at those words again. It says, when Christ, who is our life. Wow. In my translation, ESV says, when Christ who is your life. <laughs> now you want to know this, man. You want to see this. You want to wake up every morning and see the life he has given to you and me. Do you know, our life is not about all the things that we get involved in. No. Because all those external things, the Bible calls them transient or temporary. They are all passing away. It 
When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Verse 5 says, so because of all this, we have to put to death, therefore, the deeds that are earthly in us. When I say about denying our flesh, we're talking about walking by the Spirit. When you walk by the Spirit, by default, you're denying your flesh. You're saying that, no, I'm not going with what my soul and my body, my bank balance, the culture, the news, the reports, every other thing is saying. I'm going to go with the Word of God. I'm going to go with the revelation of Christ. I'm going to go with what God is saying to me. I'm going to go with what I'm learning about who I am in Christ. And when you're moving with the Word of God, you're denying the flesh. Now, why do we have to deny the flesh? Because the Bible says that in Romans 8, Let's stay in Romans 8. Why do we have to deny the flesh? For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Verse 6. For to set your mind on the flesh is death. We have to. We have to deny our flesh. Because if you don't deny your flesh... It will lead to death, meaning that you will, you will be prevented from experiencing the life-giving aspects of the Spirit of God. Remember the peace of Christ. Jesus said, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. So, so in, in this case, look, if your head is buried in the world, I can guarantee you, you can never walk in peace. You can't, even as a believer. If your mind is entrenched in all the problems that is going on in the world, all the problems in your own life, you cannot walk in the peace of Christ. Because what you're doing is you are moving by the mind of the flesh, not the mind of the spirit. Because where is the mind of the spirit? Above. The mind of the spirit thinks from God's perspective, always. And, and we know we have that mind because we have the spirit of Christ in us. So number one, we deny the flesh because if we let our flesh rule us, it leads to death. The Bible said that the law of the spirit of life has set us free. Why do you deny the flesh? Because you're free. He says the law of the spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. Do you know you're free from the influences of your flesh? We're free. Yeah. Romans 8, 1 says it. You're free. And then that's the reason why he says that we don't have an obligation to live according to the flesh. We don't owe the flesh anything. We don't owe the world anything. We don't have to be like the world. We don't have to think like the world. You know, sometimes as a believer, you might find yourself in a space where everybody's thinking in a particular way and you want to think according to Scripture. You don't have to feel pressure. No, because you're a different person. You're not of the world. Jesus said, I'm not of the world. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. We are not in the flesh, Romans 8, 9. We're in the spirit, right? And we are free. We are not the people of the flesh. Now, let's go to Romans 6, 1, and we'll answer this question. How do you walk in? How do you deny your flesh? <laughs> How do you deny your flesh? Okay? How do you deny your flesh? There are some incredible factors that we need to consider. There is an issue here that I want to draw your attention to. The issue is that Christianity is not about what we do, but rather what has been done. This is why Christianity is a life we live by faith in who Christ is and what he has done. Now, this is important, right? Because our life is not a life by works. It's a life by faith that results in works. But it doesn't start with works 
It starts with faith in what Jesus has done. So Christianity is not about what we do, but rather what has been done. In other words, Christianity is living your own benefits, right? And whose benefits are you on? Jesus Christ. So the psalmist said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not any of his benefits. And then he starts, who forgives all your sins. <laughs> so, so Christianity is not about what we do, but rather what Christ has done and us living by faith in that. Now, so the first thing we have to do is we must recognize and come to the revealed knowledge of what has been accomplished in the area of the flesh. That's the first thing. To deny your flesh, you have to first recognize what has been done to the flesh. And 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, we have all died to our old self. Number one. Colossians chapter 3 verse 9, he says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self. <laughs> so, so we have to first recognize that Jesus has nailed that old self to the cross. One of the translations said, do not lie to each other, for you've gotten rid of the person you used to be. But you know something? Most of us do not believe that. Do you know we don't believe that? And do you know why we don't believe that? It's because of our natural identity. Because we have memory, right? You have memory of things you did yesterday. You have feeling, well, I, I, you know, I, I've always felt depressed. The Bible said, if any man be in Christ, they are new creation. And old things have passed away. And all, it didn't say some, he says all have become new. And so the first thing is we must recognize what has happened to our flesh. Romans 6 from verse 1. We'll finish with it. Let's go to Romans 6 from verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. In other words, are we to continue to live in our flesh? And then he asked the question, how can we who died to sin live in it any longer? <laughs> wow. He's asking the question, how can you you died with Christ. We read it, Colossians, we have died with Christ on the cross. He says, how? He says, think about it. You come and you'll think, oh, yeah, you know, man, I, I, I'm struggling with this sin. And Paul's saying, how can you who have died to, to sin live in it any longer? And then he says this. Now, remember one thing I said a few months ago that the rest of our Christian life is about knowing. It's about knowing, not just having. Because Peter says, uh, you know, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertains to life and godliness. And Ephesians 1 says we have all spiritual blessings. So the rest of our life is through the word of God to discover what we have. So Paul here says, verse 3, do you not know? So remember, the first key to denying yourself is about knowing what has already happened to your flesh. And believing in it. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Now listen to this. Verse 4. Look at those three words. Think about those three words. You were buried. <laughs> wow. We were buried, brothers and sisters. <laughs> we were buried. Not you will be buried. No. You were buried. And what is he talking about? The flesh. That old self, it was stripped away. But I know, look, uh, do you know, when God was showing me this, I, I struggled. 
because I, my, my, I can feel like I'm still old. Like I, I can still feel like I'm worldly. But he said to me, well, Christianity is not about how you feel. It's about faith in Christ. We were buried with him, therefore, uh, by baptism into his death, into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. No, he says, no, that we were buried with him. Verse 5. For if we have been united with him in a death like his. Again, he's making an argument here. The question is, have you been united with Jesus in a death like his? Yes. Faith in Christ is you identifying. When you receive Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are identifying with him when he went to the cross. So to believe in Christ means that you are saying that what he did on the cross was you on the cross. So you have been united with him in a death like his. And it says we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Verse 6. We know. Again, what's the word? We know. Once again, we know. I want you to, if you got your Bible, just underline we know. It's about knowing. It doesn't start by doing. Because you, you know what we do is this. As believers, if we're not careful, we're in a space where we're always trying to change. Like, oh man, I, I, need, to, I need to change. And if you are in that space, you will never change. <laughs> because you are already changed in the spirit. <laughs> I, know, I know this is a bit tough. I mean, when God was showing me, I struggled, man. The Lord helped me. The Holy Spirit helped me to see. And it's because of the veil of the flesh. Verse 6. For we know that our old self was crucified. Once again, he's telling you that your old self was crucified. So now Paul says, how can you have died living it any longer? So the issue is not about I'm struggling with sin. The issue is about whether you believe that you are dead to sin. It's a faith issue. For we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. Now, verse 11. That's our scripture. Verse 11. So look at that word. He says, so you also must do what? Consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Do you know, if you have any problems, man, every one of us, we have the flesh with us. We're all going through some kind of sanctification. But you will never succeed by works. You cannot do anything about your flesh. You can't. If you could, Jesus Christ needn't come. So he had to nail it and disengage it, and you have to learn to deny it by considering yourself. And you know, I remember in my thoughts when I was figuring this out, I said to the Lord, man, Lord, this feels like me pretending I don't have an issue. And the Holy Spirit said, yeah. No, because your mind, your, your natural mind will, will make you feel you're pretending. But you need to stick with the Spirit. And deny, reject your flesh. And how do you do it? By reckoning. The word consider means to count, to charge with, to decide, to conclude. The bottom line, to consider. To consider. How do you deny your flesh? By considering yourself. By agreeing with the spirit of what Christ has done. Other than that, you know, we go in cycles because we're always trying to change. You can't change your flesh. You can't. You need to get this. No one can change their flesh. No. Why? It's because Jesus had to die. Because the flesh has to die. God did not renovate us. No. 
God gave us a new life. He didn't renovate you and me, no. So what we are trying to do is renovate ourselves. And of course, that's what the entire world is doing. They're trying to become better people. No, no, God didn't come for us to become better people. He came for us to become new people. A new creation, that's what it says, right? So how do we deny ourselves? By first recognizing that, wait, this thing that I seem to struggle with, Jesus has already killed it, and that is not who I am. So by faith, I believe that I am new. And then you begin to put that into practice on a daily basis. Amen. Let's be on our feet. That's all I got. Okay. Let's, let's just lift up our hands and thank the Lord for what he has done. Denying our flesh starts with thanksgiving because he's already done it for us. We sing about the victory of Christ, the victory of the cross, and it was victory over our sin. It was victory over the flesh. It was victory over the old person. Old things have passed away. So that is the reason why Paul says we don't, we don't owe anything to our flesh. You know, sometimes we feel, one day the Spirit asked me the question, how do you break free from something that you've seen yourself do it over and over again? And I thought, like how? And he says the only way is faith. Christianity, the Bible said the kingdom of God is for children. What I'm saying, on one hand, it's a little bit difficult. But if you can think with childlike faith, you can receive it. It says, consider yourself. I mean, do you know kids are good at pretending? <laughs> and for a flesh, if you begin to walk by faith, your flesh will tell you, man, you're pretending. No, we're not pretending. It's true. You and I, we were buried.